After stunning comics fans by leaving Marvel for DC in 1970, Jack Kirby began plotting his biggest story yet. A Clash of Gods told across three titles, The New Gods, The Forever People, and Mr. Miracle. The Fourth World was due to be Jack Kirby's final masterpiece, the culmination of a career bursting with imagination. The bold ideas he created at Marvel, but kept to himself, were supposed to be the keys to success at DC Comics. Now, Jack could have played it safe at DC and tackled any of their iconic heroes, but that really wasn't his style. Instead, he had big, grandiose visions of creating a new pantheon of gods. And most of all, he wanted to remind everyone, especially Stan Lee and Marvel, that the king still ruled. Let's go behind the panel for part two of our look at Jack Kirby's magnum opus. Well, we've had to break out the umbrella because rain is an occupational hazard yeah. of a walking tour. We're in front of the Boys Brotherhood Republic, which is a boys club that Jack joined as a young teenager and it really changed his life. He learned drawing from other boys and really practiced there. He did cartoons, his first comic strips he did as part of uh, the youth programs that he was involved in here. And it was really what set him on a more positive, like uh, artistic, place for him to be able to be and to make art. Jack Kirby sort of had already established his legacy. I mean, he was the king. He was really Jack the King Kirby. So the king doesn't have anything more to prove. Perhaps he did have something to prove to himself. Having gained at DC a certain level of creative freedom that he never had at Marvel, Kirby cut loose. Nearly every page exploded with mother boxes, Mobius chairs, and boom tubes. One of the things that Kirby always was a gigantic influence is that he had more energy than I think anybody else in comics. There are a couple of people that you can see that strong influence today. The Forever People was the first fourth world book to drop on December 1st, 1970. Every three weeks, a new chapter in the saga would be released. The stories were frenetic and mirrored their creator's urgency. DC Comics publisher Dan DiDio remains impressed by Kirby's relentless productivity. The most fascinating thing about Kirby's Fourth World is the fact this is a guy doing four books a month. Think about it. Writing, drawing, editing, putting it all together. Four books a month. So how much thought do you put into that? And, and how much of that's just pure emotion and id that's winding up on the page. Kirby's art was always fueled by emotion and his memories. His time as a soldier on the front lines in World War II influenced many of the battles he crafted in his comics. The fourth world's central theme of gods walking the earth always fascinated Kirby. He actually started to develop the concept of a new race of gods replacing the old ones of classical mythology back when he was still at Marvel. Compare the story of Ragnarok from the Tales of Asgard backup story in Thor 128 to the opening of the first issue of The New Gods. He held on to these ideas and waited until he left Marvel to bring it to life. And there was no denying the energy within each Kirby comic. The problem fans had was with the story. Jack's dialogue style was controversial, especially from people who'd grown up on Stan Lee dialogued Kirby art at Marvel and were expecting the same thing. Jack didn't think like Stan. He didn't write like Stan. He didn't write like anybody else. As I read the books over the years, at first I was a little uncomfortable with it. But then I started realizing this is not old Marvel comics. This is not 60s Marvel comics. It's something brand new. And it's something that has Jack in his purest form. I don't think he could have possibly done as good stories from a visual standpoint if somebody else had been running the dialogue. The fact was that Jack was a writer first and an artist second. And all his life, he thought like a writer, even when somebody else was responsible for the script. As I read the old Kirby books from that period again, I like them more and more with each reading. I understand more and more of them. A lot of it went over my head, frankly, when I was 17 or 18 years old. Fan reaction may have been split, but sales of the comics were actually just fine. But as Evanier points out in his Kirby biography, a turning point occurred when DC found itself on the losing end of a cover price war with Marvel. Kirby's comics never recovered. The unreasonable expectations surrounding his arrival at DC certainly didn't help matters. All three titles would be canceled in 1972. A devastating blow to Kirby. Um, the day after they told Jack they were, quote, suspending, unquote, New Gods and Forever People, he sat my friend Steve Sherman down with me and he told us, and he looked like a man who had been re punched repeatedly in the face. He was just gray and devastated and very sad. He didn't stay that way long because Jack had a very strong work ethic and he pushed up his sleeves and went back to work on something new. But um, it was a very tragic day. I felt so sad for him. He, he was trying to put a brave face on it and uh, he felt he'd been uh, fragged by his own troops. What we needed in order to make the fourth world more popular was more time for folks to be able to read it. I think it's a work that benefits from being read as a book. 
People might not have realized it when they were reading it book by book. They might have been looking for a more linear or complete story. But when you look at the whole thing combined, you see this tapestry that he built, and it is incomplete. And I think that's where, the, where we get our excitement from, because you want to participate in something that, that creative and, and that immersive. The content of The Fourth World is comics that are very much more aimed at adults. You're looking at material that's really seriously about World War II. It's about the rise of fascism. It references the Holocaust and other things that might not be what a little kid is looking for. And it has a lot of psychedelic aesthetics that you're more likely to appreciate at an older age. But I also look at his work from that period and I see cubism. I see references to um, art from Oceania and from the Central America that you see in you know, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And, things like that, and um, those kind of influences might not be something that little kids would pick up on right away. The Forever People and the New Gods were canceled after 11 issues. Mr. Miracle lasted a bit longer, 18 issues. And that was that. Except the funny thing happened on the way to comic book purgatory. Fans kept discovering the fourth world. Over time, the fourth world has gone on to become a beloved and influential series with perpetual reprints and characters that have become mainstays of the DCU. Its influence actually extends beyond comics. After all, there's no denying the similarities between the fourth world and Star Wars. It's a story about a guy who doesn't know his father is evil. Oh, you mean like Darth Vader? <laughs> uh, yeah, and he relies on um, uh, something, uh, a strange um, energy that he can only access in, in a certain way and it, and it gives him magical powers. You mean like the force? No, it's the source. It's like it's, it's all the same, right? And, and even in like, okay, well, what, what's the bad guy called? And he's like, oh, he's called Dark Side. You mean he has Dark Side? No, he's, it's, it's like all the same. So I grew up with Star Wars first. So I'm like, oh, this seems like a ripoff of Star Wars. I didn't realize that Star Wars was ripping off it. Scott Hanna, who has inked more pages of comic art than just about anyone in history, says Kirby remains a major influence on comic artists even today, more than two decades after his death. We've gone in and out of his influence. Like sometimes we get almost photorealistic, sometimes we go more manga style. Um, but Kirby, his design sense was just phenomenal. His energy just like jumped off the page at you. It's influenced every major comic book since him because he kind of developed the visual style at both Marvel and DC, amazingly enough. And we use his character designs all the time. I actually worked on one of his creations after he passed away. He had some creations that had never been published. So I got to work with his family over his artwork. One of my early gigs at Marvel was actually working on a big uh, collage of different characters, including working over Kirby's pencils. In 1984, Kirby finally had the chance to return to his unfinished opus and conclude his saga of the new gods with the graphic novel Hunger Dogs. He never meant for his story to be open-ended, but his characters proved too popular to die. They've appeared in the Justice League animated TV series and the live-action movie. They've also continued to inspire new comics tales like Cecile Castellucci and Adriana Mello's new Female Furies miniseries. It's those new voices and perspectives that keep the legacy of the fourth world alive, according to Dan DiDio. There's so much great ideas that Kirby put together. And there's a lot of rawness and incompleteness in it. And so many people are so beholding to Kirby's legend and his, his legacy, they're afraid to break it and mix it and turn it around, which is probably exactly what Kirby would not have minded. And in the not too distant future, director Ava DuVernay's big budget New Gods movie will arrive in theaters. Tom King, who together with Mitch Gerrids, won a mother box full of Eisners for their brilliant take on Mr. Miracle, is co-writing the screenplay. My job there is to bring two unique American geniuses together. So Kirby is this, you know, poor um, uh, Jewish uh, son of immigrants, war veteran who sort of took that experience of being raised in what he would literally called the ghettos of New York on the Lower East Side and took that experiences and sort of that pain and put it in comic books and changed pop culture forever. I see Ava as, as a parallel figure to that. As someone who's, who's changing pop culture in her way and taking her experience and growing up in Compton, not too far from where I grew up. If I can get those two passions and those two brilliant minds to hook up, we can make something the world's never seen before. One of the joys of my life has been that I watched Jack being told that the books were not commercial, that the books would not sell, and that nobody ever, any place, would ever license the characters and make toys out of them or put them into TV or movies. They were considered failures for a while by many people, and now some of those stories are going to their ninth or tenth printing. Jack Kirby's Fourth World was years ahead of its time. Today, all those characters and concepts he brought to life endure as important figures in the DC Universe and beyond.
one can't help but think the high father of this comic's masterpiece is smiling somewhere at the journey his new gods and forever people have taken. I think The Fourth World is Jack Kirby's greatest art, and I also think it's the greatest comics, period. Uh, I think that at that point he had the creative freedom to be able to go as experimental as he wanted. His work with collage, which he'd done some of in Fantastic Four, he was really able to expand on that there. You can see the different cultural influences from art from around the globe. Um, he really loved hippies, and I deeply appreciate the fact that this was a man who was from an earlier generation who saw something in the kids these days and felt positive and enthusiastic about it. Uh, and you can see that unbridled sort of psychedelic energy really permeating it. Um, and, you know, working with Royer was such an amazing anchor for his work. I think these are the finest comics. It's been staring us in the face now for decades, so, yeah, good, Jack Kirby is just, is just, he, he's, on, he, he's just on another plane. He was just on another plane and just goes, oh, oh another, a, a whole another galactic done. And I won't do any underdrawing while I'm doing it. Like, what are you talking about, right? Phew, go. So, there are gods, and Jack Kirby's like about two inches to the left of those guys. I have in my office uh, a little shelf that's full of the bound hardcover editions of the fourth world and it makes me smile just to look at them there and realize that Jack was right and all the people who decried his work were wrong. Long live the king. Thanks for watching. And don't forget, Behind the Panel is much more than just a video series. We have a weekly column at SciFiWire.com as well as an audio documentary series. Listen and subscribe to Behind the Panel wherever you get your podcasts.